welcome you this morning. It's a beautiful, beautiful morning to be at worship in the house of our Lord. And I welcome you to the uh, 11 o'clock service. My name is Susan Ray, and I'll be the liturgist for this morning. I am told I am to make you aware of the blue sheet. Every one of you has one. And I urge you to look through it because there really are a lot of areas here where you can be of service, and that is what we are called to do, to be in service. So please look through it and prayerfully consider where you might be able to contribute. I'm specifically asked to bring to your attention the homemade peanut brittle sale. I have trouble saying that because I don't need it. But anyway, today's the last day for orders, and the orders can be picked up uh, on Wednesday after 12.15, right in the kitchen here at the church. And don't forget the Christmas cookie sale, December 17th. We need lots and lots and lots of cookies to make this a successful, we're trying to outdo the soup sale. So please sign up, there are sign-ups at the entrances. Make the cookies, come buy the cookies, bring your friends and neighbors to buy more cookies. Uh, and don't forget to, uh, to get that done. Grab a few grandkids, they're always fun to do with them. We are so blessed this morning to introduce and to welcome to the pulpit uh, our own Pastor Myron Jones. They've given me a little bit of an introduction about this man who claims to have retired in 2009, and yet here he sits. <laughs> I don't know, some people just don't know the meaning of that word. He was raised on a small farm in Juniata County, which is just east of Lewistown, the eldest of three children, educated at Lycoming College and Union Theological Seminary in New York City. For 40 years, he served during seven appointments um, throughout the Central Pennsylvania Conference of the United Methodist Church and purportedly retired in 2009. But as you can see when I get to what he's currently doing, he is anything but. His wife, uh, Bonnie, and he are the parents of a daughter and two sons, and they have blessed them with five grandchildren. He's enjoyed a lifetime of deer hunting, including archery for a time, and participating in the volunteer in mission trips beginning in the late 1970s. So currently doing nothing, he serves on the Preacher's Aid Society, the Susquehanna Conference Sierra Leone Initiative, he chairs the Altoona District Committee on Church Building and Location and participates in the Retired Ministers Fellowship. So he is a busy fellow and uh, always enjoys a cup of coffee, which puts him right there along with all of us. So as you are able, would you please stand and we will responsively read the call to worship. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. The opening hymn this morning is number 711, For All the Saints.
Okay. Lord, as we enter into the Thanksgiving season, we are reminded of all the things we have to be thankful for. Thank you for loving us, caring for us, providing for us, and protecting us. Thank you for the forgiveness and grace we receive and help us to be forgiving and graceful with others. Bless our families, friends, and our church. In Jesus' name, amen.
reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, another, I follow Cephas, and still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And from Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. Accept the one whose, weak is, whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One's person faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Grace to you at peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our opening hymn spoke of the people streaming in the heavenly gates singing hallelujah. Uh, I came across a story about some of those who were there assembled. One was a, a taxi driver from New York and he happened to be standing in front of a preacher. And when the taxi driver uh, entered in the gates, St. Peter presented him with a golden robe and a staff also made of gold. And the preacher stepped up, uh, being the next in line, and he received uh, a cloth robe and a wooden staff. And uh, uh, being curious, as most of us are, uh, this preacher asked of St. Peter, well, how is it that uh, he got that and, and I got this? And uh, St. Peter replied, well, uh, the attire is uh, based upon results. You see, when you preached, people slept. And when he drove, people prayed. <laughs> well, I will acknowledge to having put a few people to sleep in my times in ministry, but in my own defense, one happened to be a, a farmer who in the wintertime was not accustomed to the warm heat of the sanctuary. And, uh, uh, and I know he was sleeping because he snored. But we ought to be free of that with an extra hour to gather uh, in bed last evening. And uh, so I hope that uh, uh, we're able to stay awake. Uh, but um, I wanted to center our attention on the question this morning of whether we are a place of good news. Because good news is our primary purpose as disciples of Jesus Christ. We're not far from the Christmas season, and that has the angels talking to the shepherds on the hillside outside Bethlehem with the words, Behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And the Gospels themselves are 
vessels of good news. Gospel in the Greek means good news, euangelion. Uh, so John frames his gospel with those familiar words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And words that I think are just as important for us to proclaim, John 3, 17, for God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. God proclaims acceptance, not rejection. And we are to be messengers of that good news. Paul tells it to the Romans in chapter 8, God demonstrates his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Without any worth, without any claim upon God, God freely gives his grace, his goodness, his mercy to us. And we are in turn to be messengers of that good news. I can't find anything in the world that is like that. Love is everywhere else conditional. But in Christ, God's love is without condition. He loves us while we were yet sinners. And indeed, that is a difficult thing for us to grab hold of. But when we do, it is liberating. Paul Tillich, the 20th century theologian, proclaimed, simply accept the fact that you are accepted. Accept the fact that you are accepted just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. We don't have to have our ducks in a row, making ourselves acceptable to God. God loves us as we are, though he may not leave us as we are. In the early days of the church, Paul wrote to the believers in Corinth when he heard that there were divisions in the Corinthian church. And asked them if Christ was divided, and he called upon them to be united, to have the same mind and purpose, agreeing and having no divisions among them. And that is advice that we could well stand to hear in this time and this place. For we know we have had disagreements among us. The United Methodist Church has become in recent months and years, what I have often typed with clumsy fingers when I wanted to type the United Methodist Church. I've looked down and there it has said, the untied United Methodist Church. And indeed, we have come untied. 100, over 140 of our congregations of over 800 have disaffiliated at this last annual conference. and. The issue that has been the reason for the disaffiliation has been one that has been festering over half a century. The place of gay persons within the church, specifically whether they might be permitted to be pastors, and if so, under what conditions. This 50-year argument over what are now called LGBTQ persons has come to a boiling point and has led congregations to separate themselves from the denomination. As I thought about why this might be, why in the words of that man in 1967 beaten by the police in Los Angeles named Rodney King, why can't we all get along? Why can't we all get along? And my thought was that perhaps rather than having our eyes on Jesus, that we have been looking to the left and to the right and looking at one another and not agreeing to worship and praise the Lord who loves us. But we have fallen into disagreements about what this one believes or that one believes. And the result has been disaffection, disaffiliation. 
in a perfect world with our eyes on Jesus, we would all be joined in the praise of God who has shown us marvelous grace of our loving Lord freely bestowed on all who believe as Julia Johnson has written, or how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be, how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love to me, Charles Gabriel in 1905. But rather than having our eyes fixed on Jesus, we've been divided, calling ourselves liberal or conservative, traditional or progressive, And then in that process, we have highlighted our disagreements rather than centering on those things upon which we agree. And we have looked disparaging at one another and used the language about right and wrong. And the Apostle Paul reminded us in Romans 14 that each of us is the servant of our Heavenly Father And it is not our responsibility or our our condition to pass judgment on one another. In gathering together the people called Methodists, John Wesley spoke saying, In essentials, unity, in matters of opinion, we think and let think. And the United Methodist Church has, across the years, been considered a big umbrella church, a church in which there is affirmation of the essentials, but in which there are many opinions and in which people think and let think. But that union has not held, and we have some who have chosen to separate. And so we are not the assembly that we used to be. But the call is still upon us to be people of good news. We are to withhold judgment and to have our eyes on Jesus because, as Paul says, each of us is the servant of our Lord and Savior, And as the downstairs staff, it is not our place to pass judgment on one another. He lifts up the experience of the church in Corinth that had its divisions over what food should be eaten. The situation in in Corinth was that as a Greek community that did not know Christianity until Paul introduced it was that there were many gods who were worshiped in the Greek pantheon. And because of that, the food in the markets had most likely been consecrated to this god or that. And Paul appears talking about the God and Father of his savior, Jesus Christ, the Lord of all the universe. And the most Profound call from the Old Testament was the Shema. Hear, O Israel, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And hearing that call, these new believers in Christ thought that they should worship God and not serve any of the Greek gods any longer. But to eat meat out of the markets was, in a sense, to pay homage to this God or that. And so these new people in faith resolved that in the strength of their conviction, they would not eat meat. They would eat only vegetables. Now, you know, not everybody thinks that way even today. And Paul did not think that way. Paul was raised as a religious Jew. He had observed the dietary laws from the time of his youth. But he did not encounter Christ until he was on the road to Damascus. And there Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And at that moment, Paul was introduced to his Savior. And he relied upon that personal interaction with his Lord and Savior to be his guide for the rest of his life. 
having been through the phase of what he should eat and what he should not eat, he had set that behind him. For he had come to believe that he worshiped the God of all the universe, the God who made everything. And as a result, he believed that he could eat anything as long as it was received with thanksgiving to the God who had provided it for him. So he was 180 degrees from those who would eat only vegetables. But Paul said, regarding those who ate only vegetables, that he would not eat meat in their presence, because doing so might risk their losing what faith they had in Christ. They were committed to living as vegetarians, showing their faith in Christ. Paul points out that he would not put a stumbling block and he did not want other believers putting stumbling blocks in the front of those who believed differently than they did. So he vowed not to offend them by what he ate. But Paul looked at the bottom line. He said, there are those of you who will not eat meat and those who do eat meat. And when you look at the bottom line, these people are praising God. These people are thanking God. So God is praised both by those who eat meat and those who don't. And God is given the glory. I would infer from that that in our current differences, though we have differences, God is being praised by those who remain and God is being praised by those who have gone forth. And the bottom line is that God is being praised. And we in our service of our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, are not to be judges of one another, but so far as lies within us, to seek to live at peace with all, to welcome one another, and not to engage in disputes. For we are not to judge another's servant. Even if we think they're wrong and we're right, even if they think they're right and we're wrong. Because Paul says at the end of those verses an amazing thing. It is the master who is able to make them stand, and they will stand. Isn't our God marvelous that out of the cacophony of our discord, those who say yes and those who say no, God receives a chorus of praise and the dissonance disappears streaming through the Holy Ghost singing to Father, Son and Holy Ghost Alleluia because as Paul said every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father You and I are not the ones to make that judgment, but we are to live at peace with one another so far as it lies within us, even though it becomes difficult and necessitates perhaps our holding our tongue when we might say something, lest it give offense. We are to do all that was in our, within our power to love our sisters and brothers and our neighbors, as well as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The disagreements that we are experiencing are not new ones. Historically, there have been divisions and reconciliations, and hopefully there may be in some form in the days that lie ahead. But in 1815, in the city of Philadelphia, in the then Methodist Episcopal Church, there were African-American individuals who felt that they were not being treated as sisters and brothers by the then Methodists. And so they formed the African Methodist Episcopal Church. In 1830, 
There were some Methodists who did not think that bishops should have lifetime service. And I believe also that property should not belong to the denomination, but to the local church. And so the Methodist Protestant Church came out from the Methodist Episcopal. And in 1845, over the issue of slavery, the Methodist Episcopal Church South left the Methodist Episcopal Church. And then again, after the Civil War in 1870, the colored Methodist Episcopal Church left the Methodist Episcopal Church South. The 19th century was one of separations. And it seems to me that the 20th was more one of reconciliations. For in 1923, I believe it was, the Evangelical Association and the United uh, Brethren Church uh, each had some comings together. In 1939, the three branches of Methodism became the single Methodist Church. In 1946, the Evangelical Church and the United Brethren Church became the EUB Church. And we all got together as the United Methodist Church in 1968. But we're in another century. And it seems we're going the other way. And division has come again. But the call is ever before us to be God's people, proclaiming good news, acceptance rather than rejection, inclusion rather than exclusion, and to seek to make God's umbrella big enough to shelter all. For Christ was one who came seeking out the have-nots, the outsiders, the powerless and the forgotten, fellowshipping with tax collectors and sinners, caring for the least, the last, and the lost. And when criticized, said, it's the sick who need a doctor and not those who are well. And so you and I are to look to the pioneer and perfecter of our faith and to follow Jesus. You may have had at one time a red letter edition of the scriptures. And I would contend that you could get along quite well in this thing called Christianity if you just read and lived by those red letters, those words of Jesus. It's enough to love your God, to love your neighbor. For in all of these, all the law and the prophets, Jesus said, are wrapped up. So let's keep our eyes on Jesus because that's where it needs to be. I thought about the times when I stood over a golf ball and how often they did not go where I wanted them to go. And so I developed this little mantra that before I took that backswing, I would say to myself, head down, eyes on the ball. Well, we no longer need to keep our heads down. We need to have our eyes up, looking at Jesus. And if you remember way back in the 50s or early 60s, a TV preacher from the Catholic Church called Bishop Fulton Sheen, did he not say, Look up and live. Look up and live. Eyes on Jesus today and every day. Let us pray. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. Thank you for forgiving our sins. Thank you for accepting us as we are. Forgive us, forgiving us, for forgiving us our failings, for loving us even when we can't keep our mouths shut, and for using us as your people, though we are poor servants, even as we strive to do all that you call us to do. Into you we surrender our lives, our witness, our deeds, 
that you may live in them and bring blessing to the world in which we live day by day. In Jesus' name. Amen. join me in the responsive call. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You are the God of Abraham and Sarah, of Miriam and Moses, of Joshua and Deborah, of Ruth and David. You are the God of the priests and the prophets, the God of Mary and Joseph, the apostles and the martyrs, the God of our mothers and fathers, the God of our children to all generations. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them to be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Strengthen us to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And by your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry in all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. The table is prepared. Would those who are assisting with the service please come forward. And do note that there is a gluten-free option for those who are in need of it at the uh, communion rails.
Let us pray. We, your people, Heavenly Father, offer our thanksgiving and praise to you for your great and everlasting love in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Accept our thanks and praise and let us all join in saying you are worthy to receive glory and power and honor and might. Grant that our praises may be joined with your people here and everywhere in proclaiming your goodness. Accept, Heavenly Father, our thanksgivings and grant us your presence as we seek to deal with the failings of which we are a part. For the strife that we know among nations, hear our prayers that you would be with leaders of all nations and states and grant your guidance and grace that healing may come through your Son, our Savior. We left up to you our own disappointments and griefs and ask that you would help us to bear them into your presence so that you might take them away from us. Hear our prayers for those who are struggling with illness and affliction to which we are prone and be our helper because you are our savior, the one to whom we may turn and find relief. Let your spirit dwell in us as we go forth, that your kingdom may come and your will be done in us and all, to the glory of your son, our savior. Amen. Go forth knowing what your heavenly Father desires of you, to seek to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Amen. Amen.